All right, let's open up the Bible to the book of Proverbs, please. Proverbs chapter number 29. Proverbs chapter 29. Francois, can you hear me all right back there? Is that a little low? Yeah, a little low. Turn me up just a little bit. Proverbs 29 and verse number 25. And that's where we're going to begin. By the grace of God, I'd like to preach a sermon to you today called The Man Trap. The Man Trap. Now, I'm not preaching about women with loose morals. Amen. <laughs> I'm completely different man trap. But in Proverbs 29 and verse 25, the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Solomon is telling us here that as soon as you start doing things based on the popular opinion of the people around you, you are going to put yourself in such a trap that it's going to be hard to get anything else done in life. It's going to bring a snare. Come, it's going to bring your life to a halt. But if you'll just obey God, just trust and do what He said as we've just sang this morning, trust and obey, that's the safest choice you'll ever make. And based on that, I'd like to preach for a little while about the man trap. If you'd help me, let's bow our heads and let's pray together and then we'll continue on. Father, please help us this morning. Lord, my desire, as you've just reminded me in this song, is to trust and obey. Lord, I have 20 other things in my head that I could preach this morning that might sound real nice. But I believe this is what you want me to say. Please help me to say it today boldly and with love. God, would you please reach down and grab a hold of our hearts this morning and speak to us. Show us what we need to know and how we can get more done for you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Way, way back in the 1500s, they say it's the late 1500s, there was actually a device that was commonly used in Europe called a man trap. Just like you would think of a bear trap or a lion trap, rabbit trap, wolf trap. You've seen these, these devices, looks like jaws with teeth in them, and if you step in the wrong spot, they clamp down on you. There were actually traps built to catch humans. Very popular in Europe for a long, long time, and it went on for about three or four hundred years. They are now illegal, although some people still use them. But the man trap, it was, it was used to protect people's homes. Now, I'm not trying to give anybody... Any ideas this morning? But they would set them up because, you know, getting to that person's manor or house or mansion, whatever it was, there were several trees out in the forest. They would just set these things up for burglars or thieves. And uh, sure enough, you walk out in the yard in the morning and you got yourself a thief or two in the middle of the night. They're not going anywhere once they are caught in the man trap. You get, that man trap gets a hold of you and it's not going to let go. You're going to need some help to get out of that man trap. Did you know that in Potrasthrum we have man traps? And again, not speaking about women, I, although we could have a good sermon about that too, right? But, 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 gold diggers aside, we have, amen, amen, you know they exist. Come on, that's, that's not mean, that's just true. Now, that, that, that could only be offensive if you are a gold digger. That's the only way that could be offensive. You know they're there. You know they're there. But uh, where, I, where I bank at, there at Ned Bank, they have a man trap. I didn't know that's what you call it, but when you go f through the first security door and then it locks you in, then, you know, it, that little light comes on, it turns red until the first door closes, then it turns green, you can go through. If they don't like you, or if you have a firearm or whatever the case might be, if there are two of you in, the, in that little room, those doors won't open. That is a man trap. That is the modern day humane version of a man trap. Now, I'm not so sure you can afford one at your home, right? You might opt for the more primitive one if you want to protect your home, but it sure would discourage me from paying you a visit. <laughs> I wouldn't want to come around. But I'm going to preach today using the idea of that man trap. And it says in verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare. It's going to trap you. And we see this, it's all through the Bible, both Old and New Testament. But Jesus, you can see it in, the, in His life and ministry. In His day, the Bible says in John chapter 12, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on Him. 
Now, I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Do you know who the chief rulers were and what they did? They were the ones that stirred up the crowd to yell out, crucify him, away with him. And it says here, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Listen to this part. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They were so deathly afraid of what somebody else would say and think of them, they would not confess their belief in Christ. Did you know that I think we still have some chief rulers amongst us today? So we have some people that truly do deep down believe, but because they are caught in this man trap, this fear of man, they will not publicly confess Christ lest somebody else disapprove of their decision. In John chapter 9, we have a wonderful story about a man who was born blind. Jesus passes by and the disciples say, Who sinned? Was it this man or his parents? And conversation ensues. Jesus ends up healing this blind man. This man who'd never seen before can now see. When presented to the Pharisees, they asked him, How did you gain your sight? He said, This guy, he rubbed some clay in my eyes. He told me to go wash at the pool of Siloam and now I can see. He didn't know a lot about him, and and the Pharisees were in doubt as to how legitimate this case was. Maybe this guy was faking his blindness. So they called for the man's parents. And the parents came in and they said, "Uh, tell us, how did this, is this your son? Was he really born blind? And if so, how can he now see? And the parents, their response was, we know that this is our son and, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. And who hath opened his eyes? We don't know. He is of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. You know why the parents did that? The next verse says, These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was the Christ, they should be put out of the synagogue. Now now let's, let's think about this for a moment. Here's a mom and dad who had a son that was born blind. Can you imagine how sad that is? They grew up, they watched that little boy grow up blind. And now, their son has come home, mom, dad, and for the first time, he can see him. Can you imagine the embrace that they shared? Can you imagine the joy in that home? Oh, if you're the mom and dad, wouldn't you be thrilled out of your socks? Our son can see. Well, you wouldn't be ashamed of that story. You would love to shout it from the housetop. Somebody's helped my son. But mom and dad fell into the man trap. And even though Jesus had done this outstanding miracle, something that had never been heard of since the beginning of human history that a man born blind could now see. First time in John 9 this has come to pass and now mom and dad won't even own up to it. They want to keep some distance from it and say don't ask us, ask him because they're deathly afraid of public opinion. If we get put out of the synagogue everybody's going to know Everybody's going to see that we're not a part of the accepted group anymore. And, oh dear, we can't have that. We don't want to be the oddballs. We don't want to stand out and be different. And God help us if anybody thinks we're followers of that Jesus guy. They fell into the man trap. I'd like to show you a passage where I, I think this is one of the classic examples of somebody who fell into the man trap. There are many in the Bible. And this one is tucked away deep in the book of Jeremiah where not too many people, not too many people reach that far in their Bible reading. But I'd like to introduce you to the story. Come to Jeremiah chapter 38, please. Jeremiah chapter 38. And verse number 14. As you find it, if I, if I can, I'd like to set the stage for the story. Jeremiah has been preaching as he should, standing up boldly and saying, Thus saith the Lord. And he had been telling the people, You have sinned, and God is now bringing the punishment. And it's not just you, but our fathers and our forefathers and the four forefathers and the fathers before them. We've all been sinning for hundreds of years, and God is now dropping the hammer. 
There is nothing we can do about it. We must be punished. We deserve it. We are going to be in captivity for 70 years. Only Jeremiah was preaching this. All the other prophets in town, all of them, unanimously said, No, God's going to give us a breakthrough. We are going to break free from the chains of Babylon. You give it just two years and we're going to get our freedom back. And all the captives are going to come back. And we are going to have great peace in our land. And we, the Jewish people, are going to rise. And Jeremiah said, No, sir, you say peace, but there is no peace. You know where that got Jeremiah? They threw him in a dungeon. And that's where we find Jeremiah at the beginning of chapter 38 sinking in the mire of a deep and dark dungeon. And one man, Ebed-Melech, he steps in and he makes petitions to the king and they have to lower some ropes down to Jeremiah and they actually drag him back up out of that pit. That's what you have in verse number 13. Jeremiah gets to stay in the court of the prison. That was... That was the reprieve that he got. He's still incarcerated, but he's no longer sitting, standing rather, with his feet in the mire. Let me ask you a question, folks. If this morning they came around, they being anyone who hates Christ, and said, if you're a true believer, we are going to take you away prisoner. What would you say or do to get out of that? Would you compromise the faith? Isn't it wonderful here in South Africa, we don't have to think about that much, do we? Just a few months ago, I was preaching to people in India that have to think about that every day. Because they come around and say, are you a Christian? And if you say yes, they begin to beat. Jeremiah, in this situation, I'm not going to judge him if, if, if he would have compromised and, and softened the message a little bit just so that I don't go back in the dungeon. I, I'd like to at least remain up here in the land of the living where there's other people that I can see and talk to. I don't want to go back in the dungeon. But now he has been beckoned by the king. Verse 14, Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. So they're not standing at the front door. It's very difficult to narrow down where this third entry was because the temple, of course, has been destroyed. So it's very difficult to go back with ancient building plans and figure it out. But at the very least, we can say this. This was one of those backdoor meetings. That, psst, hey, bud. And go, go around the back. This is not a public meeting. Zedekiah does not want to be caught speaking to this crackpot prophet. No one in Israel, no one liked this guy, Jeremiah. Abed-Melech and Baruch, those were the only two guys that would even come around. Everyone else is against him. But Zedekiah knows, if I want some truth, I better go to Jeremiah. So he calls him to the third entry in the house of the Lord, back door meeting, and the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Now isn't that irony? <laughs> hide nothing from me and they're hiding in the back of the house of God <laughs> isn't that curious hey preacher I got a Bible question but uh, boy I, this is a little bit embarrassing I don't want anybody to know that I'm asking you this uh, but do me a favor don't hold back do me a favor don't tell me what I want to hear tell me what I need to hear I hope this morning that you came to church with that attitude. Oh God, please don't let Brother Mike tell me what I want to hear. God, please speak to me and tell me what I need to hear. I need to hear. He said, hide nothing from me. God, help us. God, save us from preachers that hold back, that pull their punches just so that the people are happy and satisfied and keep coming to church and keep giving. God save us from that. God give us more preachers that will stand and, and preach the word in love and in boldness. Say, listen, this is what the Bible says. This is how it stands. I love you, but this is the truth. Regardless of what it might cost them. Can I ask you to hold your place here? I want to show you one other guy that didn't hide anything. He gave it out like it should be given. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now those of you that were here last Sunday, you'll remember that Brother Donovan, he used 1 Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3. 
I'm going to actually pick it up right where he left off. In 1 Samuel 3, verse 11, this is Samuel as a young, young boy. We're not sure exactly how old, maybe seven or eight, something like that. And the Lord has been calling him. And he said, Samuel, Samuel. And he, Samuel, because he was a little boy, he ran to Eli thinking that Eli was calling him. It took Eli three times to catch on that it was God calling the boy. So he tells Samuel, the next time you hear God calling, you need to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And in verse 11, we pick up the conversation. And the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Man, now that's something. When you hear, if somebody tells the story, their ears will go, ooh. <laughs> it'll, send a, it'll send shivers down your spine. He's telling this to a seven-year-old boy. <laughs> you know why he's telling it to a seven-year-old boy? Because he's the only one that would listen to the truth. Everybody else, they did that which was right in their own eyes. They just wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. Samuel was ready for truth in verse 12. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. Now in chapter 2, God had told Eli th through another preacher, he had told him, your house is going to be destroyed and you're no longer going to be the priest we're going to remove you and your lineage. We're going to put in a faithful guy. Because Eli, your boys have corrupted the ministry. They're abusing it. They're stealing food from people. They're sleeping with women at the door of the tabernacle. God says, I can't have that in the ministry. You're out. So now God shows up to Samuel and says, listen, I just want you to know, young man, this is going to happen. Verse 13, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons had made themselves vile. And he, Eli, restrained them not. It wasn't just the boy's fault, it was dad's fault. Dad should have stepped in, put some boundaries. Dad should have put his foot down. Dad should have told those boys, I'm not going to let this stuff go on in my house or in the house of God. Dad, he said, Dad, you should have done something about it. In verse 14, And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever serious offense. Verse 15, And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Samuel is standing right next to the man trap. Do you see that? He feared because he knew as a young boy, he's going to tell this man in his 90s that God is going to destroy his house and fulfill the punishment that was prophesied on him. I don't blame Samuel for looking at that man trap and going, Oh boy, I don't know how I'm going to break the news to this guy. Maybe I shouldn't tell him. I mean, that's between him and God anyway. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. Fear gripped his heart. In verse number 15, Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Verse 16, Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, look at this, hide it not from me. Boy, tell me everything he said. Don't hold anything back. Let me have it. Now that's how you take preaching. Preacher, don't hold anything back. Let me have it. You can preach to that crowd. You can preach to that crowd. Hide nothing, hide it not from me. God do so to thee. And more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. <laughs> he's, threatening, he's threatening Samuel. If you hide anything from me, God's going to curse you. Well now, okay, man trap averted. <laughs> then I, Because Samuel was more afraid of God than he was of man. He said, well, I don't want God angry at me. And if I, if I need to just tell you the whole message so that God can be happy then even if you're offended and even if you don't like it, then I'm going to say it anyway. Verse number 18, And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. You know what Samuel did? He didn't hold anything back. It doesn't say that he was rude to this older man of God. He didn't say he was mean. 
He just told the truth. You know what he had to tell Eli that day? Eli, you're a failure as a priest. Eli, you're a disappointment as a follower of God. You know what he had to say, Eli? You're a flop as a father. I wonder today if, if me as, as the pastor, if I look at that man trap and, and I say, God, do you really want me to tell the people that? And he says, Mike, they need to hear this and this and this and the other thing. And, and I have a decision. Do I step into the man trap and close my mouth just so that you folks can stay happy and smile and have a few giggles and go home? Or do I stand boldly and say, God, they may not like it, but boy, I don't want you angry at me. I'm more afraid of you than I am of them. Let me tell them what they need to hear. Do, do you understand that that's not an easy spot for me to be in? That's not, a dip, that's, not, that's not an easy decision to make Sunday after Sunday, but... And folks, I love you, but some of you need to hear that you're not good parents. Some of you need to hear that you're failing as Christians. Somebody needs to, listen, lovingly, lovingly tell you that you're not where you need to be with God. Somebody might need to sit you down and in the right way, with the right attitude, trying to help you say, ma'am, sir, you need to be born again. Because in the condition you're in, you're separated from God. You don't have fellowship. You don't have faith. You're not on your way to heaven. And this is how it is. And until we can be that brutally honest with you, we're not really going to make any headway. Can I ask you to come back to Jeremiah chapter 38? You've heard me say it many times that before you can lead a person to Christ, they have to get lost before they can get saved. And therefore, it is up to us to lovingly tell people they are lost. And to explain to them why we say that. We're not trying to be ugly or judgmental. But listen, you go to a doctor, you don't want him to run all the tests on you, come back with the bad news and then pull his punches and say, no, everything's fine. You're going to die. But you're going to die. He needs to tell you, you got issues. And once you accept the doctor's prognosis, then you can actually do something about it. But you want a doctor who lovingly will tell you the God-honest truth about your health. Jeremiah 38, verse number 15. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? He says, Listen, king, I'd love to tell you the truth. But uh, am I understanding the situation right? If, if I tell you the truth, you're going to kill me, aren't you? Now, everything about how Zedekiah had treated him up until this point would tell him that. Because so far, it landed him in a dungeon sinking in the mire. <laughs> he says, I, I think you're going to put me to death. And then at the end of the verse, and if I give thee counsel, will thou not hearken unto me? He says, if I know you right, and I tell you the truth, number one, you're going to have me put to death. And number two, you're not going to listen to what I say anyway. So Zedekiah, if I see this right, it would be a waste of my time and a waste of my life to tell you what God really wants you to hear. Folks, did you know that it's nigh unto useless to preach to people who are stuck in that man trap? If you are controlled by the fear of man, that is, you are deathly afraid of what the people around you are thinking of you, then even though you might sit under good preaching and get clear, plain truth, you will be unable to move and do anything about it. You'll know that, yes, I need to get saved. Yes, I need to be a better dad, a better husband. I need to be a better employee, student. I need to be a better Christian. I need to make changes. I know that what he's saying is right. No, oh, but, oh, oh, if I move off this position, somebody's going to see me move, and then they're going to, oh, no, no, I don't want people to see it. No, I'll just stay right here in my little man trap. I wonder if that's why we have so many Christians these days they grow just a little bit and then, and then get stuck. Because there comes a point in their Christian life, they say, I'm, I will go this far, but no farther. This is as far as I'm comfortable with. They get stuck in that man trap. Jesus came. The Bible clearly says that he died for our sins. 
The Bible clearly says, Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said that. Jesus said that. If you are stuck in the man trap and you're afraid of what other people are thinking of you, you know what you've done? You have wasted the life of Jesus. You've wasted his time. He spent 33, 33 years on this earth preaching miracles. Then he dies. Three days later, he rises again. And all of that is a waste if you are stuck in that man trap, unwilling to do something about it. Jeremiah says, I think I'd be wasting my time. In verse 16, so Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah. Now that, that's funny to me. I don't know if that strikes you as funny, but that, that's a little bit funny to me. This snarks. They're already standing in a secret place. They're in the third entry in the back door where no one can see him and no one can hear, can hear him. And Zedekiah says, okay, uh, let, let's make a promise. Let's, let's make a deal, but let's do it secretly. If I'm Jeremiah, I'm looking around going, secretly? <laughs> what do you mean secretly? No one, no one else is here. <laughs> no one else can hear it. That's how strong the grip is of the man trap. Zedekiah does not want anybody to find out that he is making a private deal with Jeremiah. Saying, Jeremiah, I'll make you a deal, but it's got to stay secret between you and me. Don't tell anyone else that I've been talking to you. You see, Jeremiah, he was the crackpot in town. No, no one else respected Jeremiah. If anyone finds out that Zedekiah the king is getting advice from and help from and following Jeremiah, what will that do to Zedekiah's reputation? He, he can't be caught supporting that preacher. Why, no one in town likes that preacher. He says, he swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not be put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. He's happy to support the preacher as long as no one else knows he's doing it. You know, I think most of you folks that have been with us for some time now, a few years, you know that I don't push church membership very strongly, do I? I, I don't think I've ever preached about it. I've made one or two announcements that if you want to sign up as a member of the church, you're, you're welcome to. Do you know why we have church membership in our church? Now, other churches, that's their business. They can do what they want. But we have, we have one real reason we do it. If I die, you can vote for the next guy. That's it. That's it. You can ask our trustees. I mean, you guys were at the meeting, right? That's it. If I die and you are a member, you get to pick, or at least vote, on who comes in next. That's it. But if I can, can I say something from, just, just from me? Can, is that alright? Can I do that? Can I be honest with you guys? I sure would appreciate the support. I, it, would re, it would really be encouraging to see somebody say, I'm not ashamed to be associated with that church and with those ministries, and I like what they're doing, and I appreciate what that pastor is doing. I'm going to sign up because I don't mind taking a public stand with some other Christians that are trying to get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we were to flip this around and you were the pastor, you would appreciate that too. I feel better. Amen. All right. Man. Verse number 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel. <laughs> I like that. He says it three times. Thus saith the Lord. Who's that? The God of hosts. Who's that? The God of Israel. <laughs> you know what Jeremiah's hammering home? Zedekiah, this isn't coming from me. God said it. God said it. God said it. <laughs> so I want you to know, Zedekiah, God said it. If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this, shit, this city sorry, shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. He says, Zedekiah, here's the advice that you need to hear. You need to know that you have earned this punishment. And Babylon coming against us and taking us into captivity, we, we deserve that. And it's time for you to take your medicine. Admit that you were wrong and that the nation was wrong 
and that the nation has been wrong for hundreds of years. And Zedekiah, you need to admit that publicly. He said, I want you to go out there and go, go to Nebuchadnezzar and say, I give up. I surrender. I won't fight against it anymore. God is punishing us, and I admit it, we deserve it. Now, that is incredibly unpopular. For him in his day to surrender and say, that's it. We're no longer going to fight against the enemy coming in to take us over. We're going to give up. Do you realize how unpopular that is as the king? He says, but that's what you need to do. You need to recognize that you deserve all these bad things that are happening to you. Folks, can I be honest with you? Some of you need to admit that the rough times you're going through in your life, you did it. You brought this on yourself. And as we, if I can use a golfing metaphor, I don't know if we have any golfers here today, but when you hit a ball out into the trees or out into the weeds, what they say is take your medicine. You don't go out into the weeds and try to hit a miracle shot out of the weeds or through the trees and get it onto the green in two. What you do is you take out your, your pitching wedge, just hit a little shot back into the fairway so that you can play real golf. Sometimes you just need to admit that shot I just made off the tee was horrible. And it was my fault. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't my friend that said something. It was me. I'm just a horrible golfer. I know how it is when we play golf. It's everybody else but not me. I, I can't make it. Somebody else made me do it. <laughs> no, you're just a bad golfer. And you hit it into the weeds. Admit it. You are way off course. And you need to little by little take your time, humble yourself, rather than, oh, watch this, guys, watch this. I've got a window this big. I'm going to hit it right there. You're not going to hit through that. You're going to hit another tree and go even farther into the woods. What you need to do is just say, all right, I, I get it, my mistake, my bad, and just chip out to the fairway and then you can get going again. Do you guys understand what I'm driving at here? Some of you made some decisions in your past. You hit some bad shots and now your life is out in the weeds. You're in the midst of these trees and man, I'm problems all around you. You put yourself there. Admit it. Admit it and say, you know what? I'm going to take my medicine little by little. I will do what God wants me to do to get my life back onto the fairway where I need to be so that I can actually be productive for God. But you need to admit it. You need, you need to surrender and say, I give up. I'm done whacking through the weeds trying to fix my own life, trying to prove that I can do it, I can do it, I can make it work. Oh, no, 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 I meant to hit it in the woods. I, I wanted it here. This is, I, got, I got this little five-inch window. It's perfect. I got this line. No, no, no. You messed up. Now admit it. Say it was my bad. You, you know how a sinner gets saved? He needs to admit that he's sinned, that he's broken the laws of God, and he's not right in the sight of God. He put his life out into the weeds. And rather than saying, watch this, God, watch how I can fix my life and save myself, watch how I can get myself to heaven with all the good things I do, he's not impressed. You know what he says? Humble yourself. Go to the foot of the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I know you died in my place. I surrender. I give up. I'm no longer going to try to save myself by being a good person. I can't be good enough. I accept what you did. I will surrender at your feet. You take over. That's where salvation starts. Is you humbling yourself in such a manner. But you know, especially I know us guys, when we hit out into the weeds, we want to prove how great we are. We can just get it back on track. No. Don't fall into that man trap of trying to prove yourself. Just accept it. In verse number 18, But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. He said, listen, this is going to get bad. If you don't give up, it's going to get bad. They're going to burn the whole thing down. Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah in verse 19, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. Zedekiah said, here's my problem. Jeremiah, I'm stuck in this man trap. 
Do you see it in verse 19? I am afraid of the Jews. He's not afraid of the Babylonians. Although the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, those are the people coming in and burning the city. He says, I'm not afraid of them. I'm afraid of these other Jews that have already been taken into captivity. If I were to now surrender and, and, and go that way, they would make fun of me. They would say mean things about me. I don't like that. Can't have that. Zedekiah would have to publicly admit that he was wrong in front of all those Jews. He would, you know what he'd be saying? Our forefathers were wrong. And all the other prophets in town were wrong. Because all the other prophets in town, all the other preachers on TV and Facebook and YouTube, all of them said, we're going to pull through this, we're going to make it. Now Zedekiah would basically be saying they're all wrong. We can't make it. Jeremiah is the only one that told us the truth. My goodness. Not only would he have to admit it, but he'd have to admit it publicly. Who would not see the king doing this? I mean, this would be all over Facebook and newspapers. and YouTube. Everybody would be there. Reporters would be there. Oh, Zedekiah, Zedekiah, can we get a quote? Why are you doing this? Everybody would know about it. Public knowledge. You know what I have found scares people to death about Christianity? Not what you have to believe, what you have to do about what you believe. It's, it's very simple, guys, to sit here and listen to the preaching, nod along, quiet amens, yeah, 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 he's probably right, he's probably right. But now I'm asking that at the end of the service we actually go do something about it. That when you hear the message about Jesus Christ and, and His His payment for your sins, His demand on your life to forsake all and follow Him, to put that into effect, to actually say to Ma and Pa, listen, I, I know we've done it this way for a long time, but the Bible says this, and I'm going to change my life accordingly. It might cost me some friends, and this may not be a popular decision, but I'm going to do it. That's where I found people get stuck in the man trap. Very easy to sit and believe it, but to go and do it, ooh, ooh, I, I, can't, I can't get out of the man trap. I'm afraid of what they'll say. You know what I've found very curious for years now? And, and, and might I say this, with, please understand, I, I mean this in the right way. I've had people come and ask me honest questions about this. And, and, and they mean very well when they ask about it. But I'm going to address it now publicly. I say, Pastor Mike, why at the end of the sermon do you have a stand and then ask us to come forward to pray? And, and the question, and this is an honest question, okay? It's a good question. Can't we just pray where we're sitting? Why do we have to come forward to pray? Now that's a fair question. This is what we call an altar call, okay? When we call people up to an altar where they can pray. And, and it's true, you don't find a, the altar call exactly the way we do it in the Bible. You do find people at the end of a service falling on their face and praying. Now purposely, not, not fainting, eh? purposely getting down to pray. That, that is in the Bible. That's in a church service in the New Testament. They fall down and worship God. That, that's there. You say, but Pastor Mike, nowhere does it say we have to come forward to pray. Why can't I do it right here? I think I know why. I think I know why that's a problem for some. Now, just let go through this with me. Help me out here. At the end of the service, what do I always say? Let's all... Stand. What's the next two things I say? Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm trying to give you some privacy. <laughs> Not everybody does that, but... <laughs> Heads bowed and eyes closed. Right? Do you know how many people do that? 99%. Very rarely does anyone just sit there. Say, I'm going to stand up. Why am I going to stand up? Sit down. Listen, could, could you, does it really make a difference if you stand? No. Could you make the same decisions for Christ from a seated position? Yes. But you don't have any problem standing. When I say bow your heads, heads go down. Like I said, for the most part. There's a few curious people just wanting to know, is everybody else doing it? Oh, okay. <laughs> that happens. I don't mind. It happens, you know. It happens. 
Heads bowed, eyes closed. So we all stand, head bowed, eyes closed, and down like that. Good. Generally, nobody has a problem with that. Where does it say in the Bible that we have to stand, bow the head, close the eyes at the end of a service? Anybody got that verse? I don't have that verse. No one's ever come to me and said, Pastor, why do we have to stand and bow our heads and close our eyes? No one's ever asked me that. But you know what they do ask about? Why do we have to come forward? What do you think the difference is? Because if you step out and come forward, somebody might see you. Somebody will know that you're reacting to the message. <gasps> oh dear, that might indicate that you were actually guilty of whatever was being preached and you want to fix it now. And we can't have that. Listen, let me keep my guilt to myself. See, now, now, now as the pastor, there are certain things I have to do, right? I have to make some decisions. What songs do we sing? The Bible didn't tell us to sing those four songs. It does tell us to sing, but not those four. I had to make a decision. None of you had any issues with that, I, I don't think. I mean, most of you sang. Most of you, that, those of you that can sing, you sang. <laughs> some of you that can't sing, sang anyway. I heard it. <laughs> I appreciate it. But you don't mind these little decisions as long as it doesn't require you breaking free out of your man trap. Some of you would feel quite liberated if you could finally break free from it. In verse number 19, I'm afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. Yep, these other Jews, they would have said things like, uh-huh. So, Zedekiah, you couldn't stand up to Nebuchadnezzar, could you? <laughs> you wimp. You weakling. Oh, you're just giving up? You're a quitter? Is that how it goes? Fine. We're Jews. We don't give up. This isn't our culture. <laughs> we fight the Babylonians. We don't give in. They would have said all sorts of things. That, you know what they probably would have asked him? Where, where did you get the idea to give up? Who told you to do that? And can you imagine Zedekiah saying, yeah, well, I'm, I'm listening to Jeremiah. He told me to do it. Jeremiah? The, the prophet? He's a crackpot. Why, he didn't even graduate from the theological seminary. He doesn't have an accredited degree. We got, we got hundreds of other prophets in this country. None of them agree with Jeremiah. He's the only one preaching that stuff. And you're following him? What an incredibly difficult situation it would have put him in. But verse number 20, Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Calm down, Zedekiah. Good grief. Don't lose your head. It's not that bad. They're not going to be all... They're not going to be making fun of you like that. And even if they do, big deal... He says in verse 20, Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So shall it be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. He says, Zedekiah, if you want to find some peace in your soul, just do what I'm telling you to do. Because it's not me telling you. God told you to do this. We sang it this morning. It's the reason I chose that song. Trust and obey. Verse 20. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be what? Happy in Jesus. You know you can't be happy stuck in a man trap? Neither are you safe. He that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That's what it said in Proverbs 29, yes? You know why some of you are incredibly grumpy? Because you've been stuck in a man trap for years. You are a slave to public opinion. You can't move unless everybody gives you a thumbs up. Jeremiah says, break free from that. Obey, I, I beg you, beseech, I beg you, obey. Do what's right even if it's not popular. And your soul shall live. You know what, he says you're going to find some peace and some joy in your soul. You think that you're going to be made fun of, you won't even care because you'll finally be right with God. And the other people making fun of you, you'll take it as a compliment. You'll say, man, at least I'm doing something right. I remember the very first time I ever preached in the open air. Oh, man, I saw my pastor doing it. I was a young Christian. This is over 22 years ago now. I was a young Christian, and I saw my pastor on the, on the street preaching to people, and I thought, oh, man, ooh, I don't know if I can do that. 
And Brother Freddie, he said, Brother Flick, come on, give it, a, give it a try. I said, man, I don't know about that. And I never would. One day on the way coming home from work, I was all by myself in the car, and the Lord started touching my heart. He said, Mike, this is your time. How about you pull the car over and preach right here? I said, man, there's a lot of people on this corner. He said, go ahead, help yourself. I said, oh boy. But, you know, in my mind I'm thinking, let me wait until I got my pastor and then I'll have him with me. And the Lord said, but I'm with you, isn't that enough? Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I parked the car. And I got my Bible because I always have my Bible with me, right? I mean, if you're traveling somewhere, God help you if you don't have a Bible with you. I had, a, had my Bible in the car. I went out to that street corner. And here, dozens of vehicles pull up, people walking down the sidewalk, and when that light turns red, time for me to preach. Boy, I'm praying the whole time, oh God, help I've never done this. Oh God, help me. Help me to remember the verses. Help me to say something right. And the light turned red, and I closed my eyes, and I went, and nothing came out. <laughs> I stood there, stuck in the man trap. <laughs> Petrified. And second after second, I mean, time slowed down right then. <laughs> time slowed down. I'm sure to this day, it gives me the hibbity to think about it. People are sta sitting in their cars, walking down the road, looking at me. <laughs> what was that? I'm the gospel statue. I mean, that's, I'm a gospel mime. I mean, what, what does that do? embarrassed and ashamed I turned around and I walked back to the car park I got in my car well let me not say that I, I got to my car I put the key to the door now this is before the automated locks right when you still had to turn a key a lot of you don't remember those days but when you had to turn a key to unlock the door you know that dinosaur of a car I, put, I, I was putting the key into the door and right then the Lord said so you're giving up huh yes sir I am <laughs> he said so that's all it takes for the devil to win. I said, no, sir. No, it's not. I put the key back in my pocket. I went right back to that street corner. That light turned red. Eyes wide open. I put my Bible to my mouth and I said, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. And I began to preach the gospel right there in the street corner. You know, it lasted probably 15 seconds, but it felt like three hours. <laughs> And by the time I got done, you know how many people got saved? None. <laughs> Do you know how much difference it made? No outward difference. Everybody just drove off and walked by and that was it. But I went back to my car with the greatest joy I'd ever felt in my heart because I was obedient. I overcame that fear of man. I, I jumped out of that man trap and I'm promising you, brother, sister, I never felt that good. To that point in my life, that was the best I'd ever felt. I actually obeyed God when I didn't want to. Oh, breaking free from that man trap is a wonderful experience. In verse number 21, he gives the warning again, but if thou refuse to go forth... This is the word that the Lord hath showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. He says, Zedekiah, you got two options. You can go willingly and you might have a man or two make fun of you, but that's no big deal. Just obey God. Now, if you don't go and... You get stuck in the man trap and try to fix this yourself and do it your way. By the end of it, you're still going to be in Babylon. You're still going to captivity, but you'll go against your will and the women will make fun of you. I'm not trying to be mean about this, but that's even worse. <laughs> oh, the girls up and down the road going, hee hee, is that a guy? <laughs> Man, it's not even the guys, just a bunch of girls laughing at you. That's brutal. That's, that's, the, that's the plain truth Jeremiah's given him. And you know what these women are going to say? Those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. Those women are going to tell the truth. Zedekiah, you're in a mess. The city's destroyed. You're now in captivity in chains. By the way, they poked his eyes out and he went blind. You're in this position not because Nebuchadnezzar prevailed. Your friends prevailed. I want you to see that. Do you see that? Do you see that? 
The reason Zedekiah would end up in that problem is because he was afraid of what his peers would think, what his friends would think of him. The friends prevailed. They put him up to it. Don't listen to Jeremiah. He's that crackpot prophet. Man, just do it the way we're telling you. Okay, at the end of verse 22, thy feet are sunk in the mire and they are turned away back. Zedekiah ends up in this dungeon. Zedekiah ends up in this captivity, in this prison, in this man trap. And guess what the friends did? They turned away and went back. Your friends will lead you right to the man trap. They don't care if you're stuck. As soon as, as, soon as your life starts to fall apart, they'll just walk off and say, hey man, that's your problem. We didn't make you do it. Yeah, true, but they sure did push you that way. And you gave in to it. Verse 23, So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shalt be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. He says you can do it the hard way. You can do it God's way or you can do it the hard way. If you want to be proud and think you got it figured out, you want to do it according to popular and public opinion, in the end, you're going to lose everything. Your wife, your children, your job. He loses it all. Furthermore, the entire community, the whole city is burned with fire. Christian, do you know that one day, you as a saved person, you're on your way to heaven, but one day at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll face a fire. Does everybody remember that? The fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. And everything you did, because you loved the Lord Jesus Christ and willingly obeyed, it turns out to be gold, silver, and precious stone, and you get rewards in heaven. Right? You get the, the privilege of ruling in the millennium, all of that. You know what happens if you do something while you're sitting in the man trap? The fire takes it, and the whole thing is burned up. You know what the warning is? One way or the other... These problems are going to happen. These challenges we're all going to face. Babylon's coming one way or the other. Now you can obey God and approach it that way. Or you can obey the public opinion and do it that way. But you obey everybody else around you. It's going to be a waste of your life and a waste of your time. It's just going to end up in the ashes. Don't get stuck in the man trap. I'm going to close this sermon with an illustration I think that's very fitting. I'm going to jump stories if that's okay, but... I think we're all familiar with Pontius Pilate. And if there was ever a man stuck in the man trap, it was Pilate. Did you know the Bible says in the book of Handelinga, in Acts chapter 3, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. He tried to release him. Three times Pilate said, I find no fault in this man, he's innocent. But the people said, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's. You're no friend of of Caesar's, oh, watch out for those friends that are going to prevail against you. Watch out for the pressure they're going to put on you. They said, listen, if you let him go, that means you're on Jesus' side and you're no friend of Caesar. And Pilate had to make a choice. Whose side am I going to be on? Am I going to submit to the plan of God? Because I know this guy is the son of God. He was convinced of it. But the fear gripped a hold of him. And he said, well, tell you what. Let's have him whipped within an inch of his life and see if that satisfies the people's bloodlust. They whipped him. Oh, did they whip him. And they brought Jesus back in front of the crowd, bloodied and bruised and his flesh torn to pieces. And they had that purple robe on him and the crown of thorns on him. And they were mocking him and, Hail, King of the Jews. And Jesus, or, uh, Pilate brought Jesus out and said, Behold the man. He thought that the Jews would cry out and say, There's our king. And they said, Away with him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Pilate said, man, I thought that would work. He said, all right, what about Barabbas? Come on, come on. Barabbas is a horrible guy. You want Barabbas or Jesus? I'll release one of them. Give us Barabbas. Get rid of this guy. No matter what Pilate tried, he could not make everyone happy. You either choose Jesus or you choose the people. Pilate chose to please the people. He gave them what they wanted. Away with him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Pilate said, all right, if that's what you want, I'll get rid of your king and you can have Caesar. And he gave the people what they wanted. 
For some of you today, you're stuck in the same man trap as Pilate. You have made everybody else around you in your life very happy. They approve of what you're doing. There's one person that's not so happy, and it's Jesus. And you need to decide today, which side am I going to be on? Who am I going to please? And break free from your man trap. Let's all stand, if you would, please. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Now we've all made it this far. You've all stood, you've all bowed your heads, you've all closed your eyes. We're doing good so far. Let's, let's take this one step further. If you are stuck in a man trap, would you come forward and get out of it? I don't know if there's ever been a more appropriate sermon to give an altar call. Because what holds a lot of people in their seat is the fear of man. And you need to break free. Say, that's not how we do it. That's not our culture. That has nothing to do with it. That's just an excuse to stay in the man trap. You know, I believe there are a lot of people that would put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They would like to have Him as their Savior. What holds them back? They're afraid of what their family will think. They're afraid of what their friends will think. They're afraid of being ostracized by society. How about today you break free out of that man trap? If you have never come to Christ, if you've never asked Him to be your Savior, would you come now and say, Lord Jesus, I know, I know you died for me. You weren't ashamed of me. You died publicly for me. I want you to live in my heart and I'm not ashamed of it. I'll accept you publicly. Sinner, would you come? Would you come now? You can come and pray. It takes all of five seconds to come and say, Lord Jesus, please enter into my heart and be my Savior. I'm tired of this man trap. Jesus said if you lose your life, you'll save it. You try to save your life, you'll lose it. Zedekiah tried to save it. You know what he did? He lost it. He ended up in captivity, stuck in a man trap. If you will die to yourself this morning, lose your reputation, you know what you'll find? Abundant joy and peace and the life God intended. Lose your life, you'll find it. Some are praying. Friend, it's not too late. If you want to come, you want to get out of that man trap, come on. I know you're a dignified member of society and God loves you all the same. Would you come? I know you got your family with you. What an impression you'll make on them if you come. They've probably been praying for you to break out of that man trap. We're going to let these folks take their time and pray when there's no need to rush. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and close the service. Before I do, though, I, I, I'd like to know who I'm praying for. If you're here today and you've never been saved, you, you're not sure that you are born again. I'm not going to embarrass you, okay? I'm not going to point you out. But I will pray for you. If you're here and you're like that, would you slip your hand up and put it up and put it right back down? Listen, no one's looking. Thank you. I appreciate that honesty. Thank you. Appreciate that honesty. Anybody else? Say, preacher, just pray for me. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm a Christian, but I'd like to be. Well, I appreciate the honesty of you folks that raised the hands. 
In just a moment, I'll pray. If, you, if you're ready, if you understand what you need to do, you can invite Jesus into your heart right where you're at. But if you have questions, would you please come find me after the service? I'd be honored to help you. If I, listen, I should be available, but if I'm not, we got dozens of people that'll help you. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. Lord, this man trap is a serious thing, and it catches so many of us, and I say us, Lord, me as well. God, help me to be obedient to you. Lord, I know, I know this isn't a popularity contest. God, it's, it's nice, Lord. It's nice to have the support of the people around you. But Lord, whether they support it or not, as long as, you, as long as you're happy with it, as long as you support it, that's what matters. Father, I want to pray for those hands that went up. Oh, God, please let them get saved today. Lord, maybe there were some stuck in that man trap, afraid to even raise the hand. Please, God, give them the grace they need to come to Christ without delay. Father, this week, help us, Lord, to be so in love with you that we're not concerned with what the world thinks. Help us to trust and obey. Father, thank you for the help. Please bring us back tonight. We want to hear more from you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.